Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, and turn to Ephesians chapter 2 for our scripture reading today. Ephesians chapter 2. We are going to read verses 1 through 9. Verses 1 through 9 of Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll read the verses responsibly. We'll begin together on verse 1. And then... I'll read verse 2 and together on 3 and alternating till we end together verse number 9. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 1. Ready? And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, you're right. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing now to the reading of the scripture this morning. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word. 
Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music today. Lord, for the good testimony today from a story of grace in the life of Lindy McKeon. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful salvation that you provided for us through Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray you'll bless the special now as it's sung and it will continue to make our hearts good soil that the Word of God can fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. Bless the special to that end, please. In Jesus' name, amen. What grace is mine that he who dwells in endless light called through the night to find my distant soul and from his scars poured mercy that would plead for me that I might live and in his name be known. So I will go wherever he is calling me. I lose my life to find my life in him. I give my all to gain the hope that never dies. I bow my heart, take up my cross, and follow him. What grace is mine to know his breath alive in me. Beneath his wings, my wakened soul may soar. All fear can flee, for death's dark night is overcome. My Savior lives and reigns forevermore. So I will go wherever he is calling me. I lose my life to find my life in him. I give my all to gain my hope that never dies. I bow my heart, take up my cross, and follow him. I bow my heart, take up my cross, and follow him. That's good. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now as we come to open up your word and look at it together this morning. Lord, it's, we need your help today. Lord, we're launching into an opportunity to look at this wonderful, wonderful truth, virtue, characteristic of God called grace. Lord, it's, uh, you know my frustration as I've studied on this and read on this and prayed to you about this. It's, uh, it's so difficult to wrap our arms around it. It's so big and it's so deep and it's so vast and it's so incredible. It's so abundant. It's difficult to get a handle on just how wonderful and how amazing and how awesome your grace really is. But I pray you'd help us today to begin to get a glimpse of how wonderful it is to be recipients of the grace of God. So help us today, Lord. Uh, move in and out of these aisles and up and down in these rows, Lord, and Stop at every occupied seat and minister your word to every individual here this morning. And Lord, may we walk out of the building in a little bit and may we each be able to say, it sure is amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. And I'll thank you for what you'll do, Lord, and I ask for your help in Jesus' name, amen. Let's see how many of the common phrases that I have that you can finish 
for me. If it sounds too good to be true, then it is. We make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. There's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no gain without pain. And God helps those who... That's not in the Bible, by the way, just so you make sure you understand that. God helps those who are helpless. That's who God helps. Everything, but you know, we just illustrated something. Everything about our American way of life teaches us a truth that you're supposed to earn what you get. You're supposed to work and, and be able to uh, earn and, and, and produce what you want to have. Uh, there, there was a day when everybody in America believed there's no free lunch. Uh, sadly, we have a larger number of Americans increasing every year that don't believe that. You know, they don't. Uh, it always frustrates me when I hear some of these uh, socialists that are in our country now and they want to pay for everybody's college and for everybody's food and for everybody's this and that. I think, where is the money going to come from, pal? Uh, it comes from hard-working people is where it comes from. And uh, that's not what the American way is all about. The problem we have in America is we relate that American way then to God. And we think we have to earn our way with God. We think that we relate our paycheck and our possessions to, to God. God doesn't relate to us on the basis of our goodness. He relates to us on the basis of His grace. I don't know of a word that's more important to the church than the word grace. I don't know of a word that's more important in our Christian life than the word grace. Without grace, we can close our doors. Without grace, we don't have a ministry. Without grace, there's no need to, for me to stand up and preach, preach because there's no message to preach. If there's no grace, there's no need for us to live for God. You see, grace doesn't give you the license to live as you want. It gives you the liberty to live as you ought. You know what grace does? Grace changes you. Grace changes you. Someone said it changes your heart because God gives you a new heart. It changes your head because you begin to think the way Jesus wants you to think. And it changes your habits because you want to do things that bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus. The one who's given you grace to begin with. A person has experienced the grace of God, there's two things that are true about him. Number one, he cannot live the way he used to. When you've experienced the grace of God, you cannot live the way you used to. And the second thing that happens is, you want to live the way you ought to. If you say, well, I don't have that today. I, I want to live the way I want to. I still, You know what? You haven't experienced the grace of God. Someone said, if your religion has not changed your life, you better change your religion. And uh, that's a good statement. Because when you experience grace in your life, it not only gives you a love for God, it gives you a hatred for what's sinful and wrong in the sight of God. At a comparative religions conference at Oxford University, the wise and scholarly were in a discussion of debate, really, about what's unique about Christianity. And one person submitted that what's unique to Christianity is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That's not a flower. That is the uh, Christ coming and being born as a man. Okay, Christ becoming flesh. And, and, but someone else remarked that there's some other religions that have the same kind of teaching in it as well. And so someone else suggested, well, I think it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But then again, it was pointed out to them that other religions have accounts of people returning from the dead. But then as the story is told, C.S. Lewis, who was a famous 20th century Christian apologist, walked into the room. He was to give a presentation and he got there early. 
And he heard a little of the debate and he said, what's this all about? And they said, we're debating about what's unique about Christianity. And C.S. Lewis said, well, that's easy. The answer is grace. Grace. He pointed out that only Christianity claims God's love comes free of charge, no strings attached. And no other religion can make that claim. If you're Buddhist, you follow an eightfold path to enlightenment. It's not free at all. If you're the Jews, believe you have to keep God's law to be acceptable to God. The, in Islam, you have to do certain things to appease Allah. Allah in Islam is not a God of love. You're trying to appease His, His anger at you. Only Christianity says there's a God who loves people unconditionally. So much so that He devised a plan of salvation that He would send His only begotten Son to die on a cross so that we might have eternal life as a free gift from Him. Plus nothing, minus nothing. No strings attached. Grace is the distinctive of Christianity. It's a very, very important word. We, there's many songs you can look through the hymn book and many songs that talk about grace. Amazing grace. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Grace that is greater than all our sin that the choir sang about this morning. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Over and over again throughout the hymn book. Now your Bible's open to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to get down to verses 8 and 9, but to get there, we have to go through the first few verses, okay? And I just want us to look at those and uh, get kind of an understanding. Uh, it'll put verses 8 and 9 in the proper context, all right? Notice it says, You hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among also, we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You know, here it's talking about evil. It's talking about sin. And it says... There's, we recognize evil. When, when somebody would buy somebody and sell them a human trafficking, so to speak, that's evil. We recognize that as pretty sinful. When you fly airplanes into buildings and kill almost 3,000 innocent people, that's evil. That's, 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 we understand that. When you engineer the murder of millions of Jews in the Holocaust, that's easy to see your heart is filled with evil. We understand that. If you abuse children and, and murder them or rape them or sexually assault them, there's something evil in your heart going on. But here's, the, here's something we have to understand. There's evil and wickedness in every one of our hearts. There's evil and there's wickedness. You can say, oh, I'd, I'd never do any of those evil things. But that evil is in your heart too. It's in every one of our hearts. And that's what Paul is trying to point out here. They're not just, he says, oh yeah, those people have a problem with evil, but I don't have a problem with evil. Oh yeah, you do. Because your heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Oh, that's their heart. That's not my heart. Oh, really? Did God make an exception? Is there a footnote somewhere in the Bible where it says, well, not Stan Slaybaugh's heart? No, I haven't found that yet. No, and your name's not in there either. Okay, don't get your hopes up. Not everybody's a murderer. Not everybody enslaves people. Not everybody commits uh, violent acts. But Paul is saying the capacity for those things lurks in every one of our hearts. 
In fact, in some places in the Bible, it says not only is there sin there, in some cases we're slaves to sin. We're bound by the sin that's in our heart. We meet them every week in the, in the addictions program that we have. And by the way, don't, don't think, well, yeah, those people are chained to addictions. No, let me, let me tell you something. An addiction is anything we do that we know isn't good for us, and we keep doing it anyway. How many addicts are in the room this morning? You tell me, if you have nothing in your life that you don't do, that you don't keep doing, even though you know it isn't good for you, then we need to have a talk afterwards. Better yet, let me talk to your wife or your husband. (laughs) Maybe we'll discover you might have an addiction. We all do. You know why? We have a sinful heart. Man is not basically good. Man is basically sinful. And that's what we have to understand. You have to understand the, 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 the evil that can lurk in our heart. And, and, and being chained to those passions, being chained to those sins, will bring us to death. The good news is verse number 4. The first two words, but God. Aren't you glad when God butts in? But God. But God. There's that word grace. Grace. It doesn't say, but God. Because I'm such a great person. But God, because I've done so many good things in my life. But God, because I have so much to offer Him. Oh, but I've heard people say all but one of those things. But that isn't why God interrupted. That isn't why God stepped in. But God, who is rich in mercy... Mercy is us not getting what we deserve. That's mercy. God in His mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us. That's the essence of His grace. God says, I'm going to intercede here and I'm going to take your life that is, that is ruled by lust and sins and desires and the, the evils of your heart headed for death And I'm going to give you a new life. I'm going to give you, in exchange, eternal life through Jesus Christ. I can exchange it for a life of love and forgiveness and meaning and purpose. And I can take away the darkness and the selfishness and the self-centeredness. And God does it all by His grace. Notice what he said in verse 6 and 7. He hath raised us up, once we're saved by grace, by grace ye saved, verse 5. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you understand? We talked about it in Sunday school today. The only way that mortality can get immortality is we have to be linked to someone that's eternal. We have to be in union with that which is eternal. And the one who's eternal is Jesus Christ. The only way, you say, well, I think if you just baptize, you go to heaven. Well, the baptistry is not eternal. It can't give you eternal life. The, your, your, your Ten Commandments aren't eternal. They can't give you eternal life. Jesus Christ is eternal. He's the preexistent one. He always was. He was in the beginning with God. The same was God. And so we're linked with Christ. We're in union with Christ. That gives us eternal life. And that's how we get eternal life. And so we're together with Him. So listen, when we're together, wherever He goes, I go. Wherever He is, I am. Understand? That's why it says, He's raised us up. What's the next word? Together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his the riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus we no longer have to be slaves to sin we no longer have to be walking dead people the walking dead is some phenomena that's come on in recent years Truth is, it's 
The Bible talked about walking dead men a long time before there ever was a TV show about it. We're, we're, we're alive physically, but we're dead spiritually. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We don't have to be walking around dead spiritually. God brings us alive spiritually. Our spirit comes to life when we put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's why Newton said, I once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. He recognized that there was a time of darkness in his life. And, and when in the middle of that darkness, God's light broke through. Newton was a great offender in the slave trade. We'll say more about that. I'm sure you'll hear more about that story and his influence of Wilberforce uh, to abolish slavery in, in England. But if God could bring that man out of spiritual darkness, He can bring anyone out of spiritual darkness. And He can bring you and me out of spiritual darkness. Because of God's great love for us. God's greater than anything in your past. God's greater than any sin that's held bondage over you or any sin that has enslaved you. God is greater than any mistake you've ever made. His love for you is greater than any sin you've ever committed because of God's great love for us. Grace. Grace. I want you to imagine for a moment we're standing at the gate of a small town called Nain, N-A-I-N. A coffin is being carried. In it is the corpse of a young man. He's the only son of his mother. She's a widow. A crowd follows in observance of the Jewish ritual of attending the dead to the grave. Heads are bowed and faces obviously show the sorrow for the bereaved. The mother weeps bitterly as she walks behind the casket for her only son, who'd been her only means of support, is now dead. Suddenly the mourners are interrupted by someone who hurries forward. And he says, let me deal with the dead. I can bring them back to life. And instantly the procession stops and they all look upon the speaker as he elbows his way through the crowd. The speaker says, all this man needs is education. He gets from his bag he carries books of science and philosophy. And he starts teaching the man laying in the coffin. But in vain they watch for any sign of life to come to the man. There's no response. Education fails. Another man comes on the scene and he's confident about claiming that he too can bring this young man to life. So he begins, now young man, make up your mind you're going to live. Exert your will. You have to choose to live. It's a matter of you believing it. You can only get up if you want to get up. You can only get up if you will to get up. And if you will to get up, you can get up. But there's no response. And the, previous confident, the previously confident man looks sadly upon the lifeless face of the young man. Willpower, positive thinking, has failed. Another man comes toward the crowd and calmly and with a sense of peace about him. For a few moments, nobody moves. Then the man speaks, My friends, don't you know what this man needs is religion. Through the knowledge of the Torah, he will be revived. And he sits down by the coffin and he pulls out a scroll. And he says, I will reveal to this young man the precepts of the law and if he'll keep them, he'll faithfully, keep them faithfully, he'll live again. <laughs> but said one of the bystanders, how can a dead man keep and observe the laws since he can't even hear your words? 
Until he's first alive, all the Jewish precepts will avail nothing. And sorrowfully, the rabbi walks away. Religion has failed to help the dead man. But then, a figure comes from the crowd, walking with perfect confidence and composure. A hush falls on the throng of people once again as he stands beside the coffin. He speaks in a calm but very authoritative voice, young man, I say unto you, arise. The people draw close. Who is this? How can he say words like that? Is there any power behind those words? What, what manner of man is this? Suddenly their questions are answered. The eyelids quiver. The color begins to return to his cheeks. The heart begins to throb once more. And the young man sits up in the coffin. What has just happened? Jesus Christ has imparted life to someone who is dead. That man was dead. It was life he needed. Not education. Not religion. Not, not, not positive thinking. The one great essential was life. That's the only thing that will make the grade. Only God's grace, which is seen in Jesus Christ, can give life. It's the only thing that can give us eternal life. But yet, how often do any of us think about grace? Consider your own life. You drove to church this morning. Hopefully, found somewhere to park. But how many thought about grace? So many, grace is just a concept, is just something we've heard about, but we don't really understand it. I want you to go to the book of Genesis with me, will you please? Genesis chapter 6. Go back to Genesis chapter 6. The first time we find the word grace mentioned in the Bible. Most of you by now know that when we go to that part of the Bible, we're in especially Genesis 6, we're going to talk about someone named Noah. Noah chapter, Noah chapter 6. <laughs> how about Genesis chapter 6? I should have just left it alone, see how many of you tried to find Noah. But uh, <laughs> Genesis chapter 6. Notice with me verse number 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Notice when it says Noah was a just man and perfect, the word perfect means he was blameless. And he walked with God. How did he get to be perfect in his generation? How did he get to be a just man and walk with God? Well, the answer to the questions in verse 9 are found in verse number 8. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Sometimes we get the idea that the grace from God came because he was righteous or because he lived a blameless life, but that's reading it backwards. Don't, don't put nine before eight. Eight comes before nine. Noah found grace because he was righteous. No, Noah was righteous because he found grace. That righteousness was the product of his having found the grace of God. Righteousness is the proof of grace, not the basis of grace. It's a great biblical principle. The grace of God, His free gift to us, comes before anything. Amazing grace. And He gives it to us solely because He loves us. 
We get the grace of God because of who He is. Not because of anything that we do. The Russian Tsar Alexander used to love to disguise himself and mingle with his people to hear what they have to say. And one night he's visiting an army camp and he listened to some soldiers and while passing a tent, he saw a young man inside sitting at a table with his head on his arm, sound asleep. He tiptoed to the back of the chair and looked over the shoulder of the young man and there on the table before him he saw a loaded revolver. Beside the revolver was a sheet of paper with a long list of gambling debts. After seeing the total, the czar noticed a sentence below the figure saying, Who can pay so much? Suddenly the czar understood the situation. The young officer had gambled away all he had and was about to take his own life for fear of not being able to pay his debts. The czar took up the pen and below the young soldier's question, who can pay so much, wrote the words, I, Alexander, czar of Russia. Quietly he turned and went home. The officer awoke later and immediately took hold of the revolver when he saw the writing on the paper that he had not put there. He read the words of the czar and in amazement he dropped the revolver. And at that moment, a messenger came to his tent with a bag of money from the czar. And the young soldier paid his debts. And his life was spared. So what's that got to do with us? Well, let me tell you, friend. You and I, we owe a large debt. Much larger than any of us could ever pay. We'd never be able to pay the price. But you see, we don't have to. Because just like Noah received his righteousness as a gift of grace, and the young soldier, through a gift, had his debt paid, so God in His grace sent His only begotten Son into this world and paid our sin debt when He died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to pay. It's been paid in full. It's been taken care of by Jesus Christ. A.T. Pearson, who is a famous preacher, said, However poor a preacher, I can preach the gospel better than Gabriel can. Because Gabriel cannot say, I am a sinner saved by grace. In the early 20th century, there was a preacher named Henry Morehouse. And he was walking in the poorer section of the city where he lived and he watched as a boy of five or six came out of a store carrying a pitcher of milk. The little boy made his way carefully along the street, but then he slipped and he fell and the pitcher broke and the milk ran all over the sidewalk. The boy let out a wail and, and Morehouse rushed over to see if he was hurt. There was no physical damage to the boy, but he wouldn't be consoled and he kept saying repeatedly, Mama will whip me. Mama will whip me. And Morehouse said to him, maybe the pitcher isn't broken in too many pieces. Let's see if we can put it together again. And the boy stopped crying at once and Morehouse went in and bought some glue and he watched him start gluing the pitcher back together again. There were one or two failures and every time the boy would start crying again but would be silenced by the preacher. And finally he got the whole pitcher pieced back together again and glued together again except for the handle. He handed the finished pitcher to the little fella and the fella took a few more steps and fell again. This time, the whole thing busted into many pieces. There was no stopping his tears this time. So Morehouse gathered the boy in his arms, walked down the street to the, new, to the nearby store, and he bought a brand new pitcher. He filled it with milk. Carried the boy on one arm and balanced a pitcher of milk with the other until he got to the boy's house. Set him down on the front step. Carefully put the pitcher into his hands. And he said, now, will your mama whip you? And the little boy said, oh no sir. Oh no sir, because 
it's a lot better picture than we had before. So what's that got to do with us? You know what? If you've never been saved, the picture of your life is broken. And, and the milk of any goodness has been spilled out and, and, and broken and if you, <clears throat> all you're waiting for is a whipping from God. It's appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment. And you may try have spent most of your life trying to piece your picture back together. Glue the pieces back together. And make the best of what you can out of your life. But God, let me assure you this morning, as God would assure you, you are beyond repair. You cannot be patched up. You cannot be fixed up. He's wanting you to admit, I can't fix my life. I can't patch it together. I can't get the pieces to fit together anymore. You know what He wants you to do? He wants you to come to Him and let Him give you a brand new picture. He, he's not trying to fix your old vessel. He wants to make you a brand new vessel. He wants to make you one with a new nature and a new life. And you know what? It's a lot better than the old one. It's a lot nicer than what you ever had before. And then He carries you. He puts you in your arms. And you know what He'll do? He carries us all the way to home until we safely arrive to the Father. That's grace. That's grace. That's free grace. That's marvelous, wondrous, matchless grace. But there's one thing He won't do. Listen to me. He won't force His grace on anyone. You have to receive it. You have to accept it. You have to see the, the need of God's forgiveness. You have to see the need that, that, that you need a Savior. And that Jesus is a Savior you need. You have to come to God and humbly put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's grace. Jesus died on the cross for you. I tell the men every week at the prison, don't, not, don't just believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world. He did. But there's people who are suffering in hell this morning that believe He died for the sins of the world. Salvation through Jesus Christ means you believe He died for my sin. He died in my place. God commended His love towards me. And that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Have you ever said those words? Being justified, Paul said to the Romans, being justified freely by His grace. That's how... How can Job, way back in the book of Job, ask a question? You know what he asked? How can man, born of woman, be justified in the sight of God? And Paul answered it many years later in the book of Romans when he said, being justified freely by His grace. Have you been justified? Have you been saved by grace? For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. The free grace of God. If you've never received His gift of eternal life by grace, I urge you to accept it today. Would you walk out and say, thank God for His amazing grace. Hey, half of this world has not heard of Jesus Christ. Half of this world does not have a Bible they can even read. And yet you're in America. You've heard the Gospel. You know of Jesus. You've, you've, you've got a Bible in your hand. How did all that happen? Is that something that you did? No, that's God's grace. God's grace. To you 
and to me. It's simply amazing grace. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for amazing grace. Lord, it's such an amazing, wonderful topic. Lord, I, I, I just... I can't find the vocabulary to describe how marvelous, wonderful, matchless, amazing your grace is. And Lord, I pray that everyone in this room would be able to say, I have experienced God's amazing grace to me. I know Christ died for me. I know He took my place. That He was buried and He rose again the third day. That He's ready to save all those who come to God by Him. And I pray that no one would resist and pass up Your amazing offer of grace to have eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And those of us who have received that offer and we've accepted Christ as our Savior. May we thank you today for your amazing grace.